In this module, we will begin our sinus arrhythmia exploration, and we're going to start with the respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Sinus node arrhythmias. There's five that we're going to be looking at in this section, but we're going to begin in this video specifically looking at the respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Now, it gets its name because it's actually impacted simply by breathing, and when we when we inhale and exhale, there can be an increase and decrease in the rate in which our heart is pumping. So during inhalation, we'll start here. We do have these barrel receptors in the heart that measure pressure. And when the pressure goes too low, they signal to the brain, we need more supply and the brain will then cause the heart to pump faster. The vagal nerve is also another element to this. And when the vagal nerve is stimulated, vagal nerves are meant to decrease and slow things down. And so if that's happening, we're gonna have a slowing of the heart rate. If the vagal nerve is inhibited, then we're gonna have an escalation of the heart rate. So let's just look at inhalation here. As we breathe in, the diaphragm pulls down and the ribs expand. So this creates this creates a lot more space in the chest cavity. And so that means pressure drops. And when pressure drops or decreases, then the vena cava, that's that vessel that's bringing all the blood back to the heart, it widens because there's not pressure on it to squeeze it. So it's going to widen out. Well, that means then the blood is going to take longer to come back to the heart because it's going to pull. Gravity is going to pull it down. And so this means our cardiac output is going to drop because I have less fluid coming into the heart. So I have less fluid leaving the heart. This is where the baroreceptors go, hey, we need a little support here. And they're gonna inhibit the vagal nerve. I don't need my heart rate to go slower because I'm already struggling with cardiac output. I actually need it to go higher. And so the vagal nerve will be inhibited to allow that the heart rate can increase. So with inhalation, we generally have an increase in heart rate because the vagal nerve is inhibited as a result of cardiac output dropping due to inhalation. Now on exhalation, we have the diaphragm pushing up, our ribs are coming in together and we're really increasing the amount of pressure that's inside the chest cavity. So intrathoracic pressure will increase. As a result, the vena cava will constrict and get smaller, and that's gonna increase the amount of blood coming back to the heart because now it's being pumped in there at a more rapid rate. So the baroreceptor will not be triggered in this case because the baroreceptor is happy. It's getting enough blood, so it's not gonna do anything. That's gonna allow the vagus nerve to be stimulated, which means the heart rate will slow down and it will pump fewer times. Here's another way to look at it, sinus arrhythmia. Vagus nerve is controlled by the peripheral nervous system. And so inhibited, when the vagus nerve is inhibited with inhalation, we have increased heart rate. Those three ins to help you remember that. When the vagus nerve is excited, then we're gonna have a slower heart rate with exhalation. Now you may have noticed this on yourself or maybe others. If you've taken their pulse before and you're like, oh my gosh, it's really fast and then it slows down, then it's really fast and then it slows down. That's what it's going to look like on a rhythm strip. So this is our respiratory sinus arrhythmia ECG tracing. It looks pretty normal from what we've learned so far. I can see P waves, I can see QRS waves, I can see T waves, and then just another set of complex, P, Q, R, S, T. The P waves are round and upright, the QRS is narrow, the T wave is round and upright, and I have to do my measurements to know for sure, but this is looking pretty good. And then all of a sudden we got this really long gap here, and we're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Well, there's a few things that it could be, and that's why we do our analysis. So if we compare this to a normal sinus rhythm, we have here up on the top our normal sinus rhythm, carrying along just like clockwork. We can predict when that next pulse is coming. And then sinus arrhythmia here below it, Boom, boom, slowing, slow, slow, boom, boom. It's gonna pick up here. So notice the irregular rhythm. This is the hallmark of a respiratory sinus arrhythmia. All other parameters will be normal except for that irregular rhythm. 
And you'll see that I have here on the bottom, this is the inhalation, where the increased heart rate, exhalation, where the decreased heart rate, and then we get back into inhalation again. So if you measure these out, you'll find that these are very similar or the same in terms of their distance R to R. But is this sinus arrhythmia or is this atrial fibrillation? Could this be a sinus arrest? Could this also be an AV block? We need to do our eight steps to find out. So let's look at those parameters next. With a sinus arrhythmia, as I mentioned, the, the only thing, I'm going to put little quotes there, the only thing that will be out of normal is the rhythm. And I put quotes there, it's a little caveat because the rate may also fall below 60 depending on your six second strip and how much exhalation you've captured versus inhalation. So atrial and ventricular rate are irregular, both of them. That's why we count both. The rate should be between 60 to 100. It may be slightly less than 60 and that would be normal because of if you've captured more of the exhalation versus inhalation, it will definitely drop. P waves round and upright. There is one for every QRS, so there's that one-to-one -one conduction. The PR interval when you measure this will be between 0.12 and 0.20 seconds. The QRS complex between 0.06 and 0.10 and 0.12 seconds. QT interval 0.36 to 0.44 seconds, and the comments are that the ST segment is flat. Now there are some other things that can cause a respiratory sorry, a non-respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And those are commonly seen with medication administration. So opioids, digoxin is another one. We'll talk about both of those. Increasing intracranial pressure and myocardial infarction. So opioids are going to depress that drive to breathe. Digoxin toxicity is also going to impact the firing of impulses. And MI is going to change the blood supply to those key areas that are generating impulses. And it can be, uh, it can cause changes in electrolyte supply. It can also cause tissue damage and death. Increasing intracranial pressure, I think I might have skipped that one. Intercre increasing intracranial pressure will affect the regulatory center in the brain. And that's going to sometimes show up as a non respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Let's talk about morphine here quickly first. So, morphine and other sedatives. They have an indirect effect on cardiac output because they cause CNS depression. They cause the, that drive to breathe has been modified as a result of those drugs. So we end up having a decrease in heart rate, a decrease in blood pressure, and a decrease in venous return. So we're not getting the, the pump isn't full. We're going to talk about cardiac output here in a second. Digoxin has a different effect. So it's going to actually slow the conduction between the SA node down through the AV node. It's going to take a little longer to get that impulse traveling down there. And that's because it's blocking the sodium and potassium pump. Now we talked about action potentials in a previous module and how important that sodium and potassium are in exchanging in between the intra and extracellular environments. Calcium here will stay inside the intracellular section and it will build up causing a stronger contraction. So this is the effect of digoxin that we want. It can also stimulate the vagus nerve, which will lower the heart rate. So digoxin has an interesting effect on cardiac output. So I've just put on the bottom here that it will increase ventricular filling time, which is known as stroke volume. We're coming to that. It's going to slow the rate and increase the strength of the heart contraction. Now we do want a cardiac output between 3.67 liters. Those numbers will vary depending on the textbook that you read, uh, but we will be just talking about that here shortly. Now monitoring for signs of digoxin toxicity is what we're really looking for to identify if that's the root cause of the ECG. So we're looking for ECG changes and this might be one of them. We'll see this non-respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And remember earlier I'd mentioned there's two questions we're gonna ask. Is my patient symptomatic or non-symptomatic? And is my ECG normal or abnormal? Again, if they have decreased cardiac output and they're symptomatic, they will start to show some signs of decreased LOC, confusion, fatigue, fainting, dizzy, a decreased out urine output, and I've got a slide coming up on that as well. The treatment for this would be to give atropine. Now atropine is going to increase the heart rate, and this is one of those drugs that's on your drug sheet. You can refer back to that. There is a reversal agent for digoxin if the toxicity is in fact causing a lot of changes in your patient. It's called digibind, digibind and this is going to create it'll bind to the digoxin and make it inactive so that it'll just be excreted. 
With digoxin, you want to be checking electrolyte levels, potassium, calcium. We talked about that exchange, that sodium potassium pump and the calcium staying intracellular. We want to make sure that they still have normal serum levels. When it comes to cardiac output, let's talk about that here because this is going to be impacting every other, every other arrhythmia. Cardiac output is the sum of stroke volume times heart rate. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that is pumped out of the heart with every beat, and heart rate is obviously how many times the heart beats per minute. Normal cardiac output, as I mentioned, is 3.6 to 7 liters per minute. Again, that may vary depending on your textbook. The average stroke volume, so we tend to use these averages in doing our math calculations because I can take a heart rate, multiply it by 60 or 70 mils for an average stroke volume to find out what my cardiac output is for my patient. So asymptomatic or symptomatic, they could be on digoxin, they may have a respiratory arrhythmia and be completely asymptomatic, no treatment required. But if they do have symptoms, we want to check to see what's going on. So neurologically, we have fatigue, confusion, agitation. They might be feeling a little bit lightheaded or dizzy. Anything to do with changes in level of consciousness, we want to be paying attention to. In the respiratory system, they may have an increased respiratory rate because they're trying to bring in more oxygen because that's part of what the body is saying it needs, and that's what's going to happen there. And they may, all feel, they may feel short of breath. Cardiovascular system, we're going to see some decreasing blood pressure. We may be bradycardic or tachycardic, depending on what stage we're at, and there will be a weak pulse. When it comes to other cardiovascular symptoms, we've got pale, cool, clammy skin, our cap refill is prolonged, and then of course we have decreased output. So we're looking to answer that question, asymptomatic or symptomatic. Now here's, here's part of the catches. Is the arrhythmia causing the symptoms or is the illness causing the arrhythmia? This is gonna be a secondary question to ask because that's gonna help you to identify that your actual treatment is relevant to the care. So in terms of treating sinus arrhythmia, as I mentioned, asymptomatic, no treatment. Just note it, let the patient know if they haven't already observed this and that should they be at home one day checking their pulse and they go, wow, it's fast, it's slow, it's fast, it's slow. They can then do a self-assessment to see if it's with their breathing. If it is symptomatic, so say it's digoxin toxicity, we talked about giving Digiban the um, antidote for that. We may also be giving atropine to increase the heart rate. Okay, so we're going to notify the doctor and then we're going to be assessing for toxicity. If it's increased intracranial pressure, there's only, there's only three elements inside this brain of ours, brain, tissue, so our cells, our blood, what's circulating in the vessels, and then our cerebral spinal fluid. So we need to be able to decrease one of those to decrease the pressure and often that comes in terms of the blood. We want to decrease the amount of fluid in there. So we will give mannitol. When it comes to an inferior MI in particular, we want to be watching what we give. So tr traditionally we give what's called Mona for cardiac events, morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. However, Morphine and nitroglycerin are contraindicated with an inferior MI, and that's because the heart is so dependent on that preload, the amount of fluid coming back into it. And the inferior MI involves that right ventricle. So if we can't get any fluid pumping out, then we're going to be seriously decompensating. You wanna make sure your blood pressure, the systolic is greater than 90 before you consider those treatments. There are alternatives. Instead of morphine, you can try fentanyl. You might be seeing that in practice. We can give fluids to increase the preload. And then of course there are other drugs like vasopressor may be given or dobutamine. Oh, there we go. Patient dependent on preload. There we go. And that is the end of our sinus arrhythmia summary. So respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Here's just a quick overview. The SA node is still in control of this rhythm. All ECG measurements will be within normal limits except the rhythm. The most common cause is the respiratory cycle, so nothing really to get concerned about. If they're asymptomatic, we just consider that a coincidental finding and just note that. If they are symptomatic, we want to review the cause because our treatment needs to match the cause in order to have the right effect. So is it digoxin? Is it morphine? Or do they have a brain issue? Do they have a cardiac, cardiac issue? So we want to make sure we're treating the underlying cause. In our next section, we're going to be going into sinus bradycardia.